It has been many years, but this city will never be safe. Not whilst he is still out there. Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! The Warden and the Wa, the Prince that was promised, and the Paunch, which astonishes the Grim and the Green. One of the most iconic rivalries in Warhammer Fantasy is launching on May 21st in the form of cross-game DLC. High Elves vs. Greenskins, Althari on the Grim, and Grom the Paunch. It may not come as an explicit surprise to many of us, we've been expecting this rivalry for more than a year at this point, but good things come to those who wait, and the unit selection here is hype, as good as we've seen from a Lord pack in recent memory. A storm is coming to Ult-1, Mad Max style, racing across the Badlands to the coast, and the Warden of Tor Ivres will have his hands full, dealing with one of the greatest Waz this world has ever seen. So, let's break it down the way we always do. Let's talk Legendary Lords, lore, and the content we can expect to see when Eltharion and Grom slam home for Warhammer 2 exactly two weeks from now. And for Eltharion the Grim, Warden of Tor Ivres, we've got one of the most prolific Groby Slayers in the setting, a badass through and through, who was the first High Elf ever to lead a successful raid on Nagarond and live to tell about it. The dude has made a career out of slaughtering greenskins, leading armies into the Badlands where he personally crucified dozens of orc war bosses and made such a reputation for himself, the green tide never stopped coming. If you guys know anything about orcs, you know they're all itching for a good fight, and so his success became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. The more he killed, the more came his way, a never-ending wave crashing against his elven crusade. And his hatred of greenskins is well-founded. It was his homeland of Athel Tamarha, and his father, Lord Moranian, that were the first victims of Grom's first Wa, and the dungeons of that ruined city are poised to become the focal point of Eltharion's campaign. Now, this may not come as a surprise, but Eltharion the Grim isn't the first rendition of this character. He was once known as Eltharion the Blind, a Kenshi, Neo, Swordmaster type character who was tortured by Malekith and blinded, who then recovered from those wounds and became an even greater warrior under Belinar the Wise, Archmage of Safari. That was retconned back in 7th edition, where he was replaced with the Grim, so named for his joyless demeanor and corpse-like voice after the burning of his homeland and murder of his father, which was a prank he did not find particularly amusing. But his people love him, despite the fact that he's kind of a party pooper, because he is a great leader and a beast on the battlefield. On the tabletop, his Blood Oath grants him plus one to hit when dueling Grom the Paunch, as he seeks vengeance for his father's death. His Fang Sword ignores armor and grants plus two strength, his Helm of Ivress grants a 5-up ward save and plus 1 to his armor save, meaning he's pretty tanky, and his Talisman of Hoeth grants magic resist and makes him a level 2 wizard of any of the 8 winds of magic. But in Total War Warhammer, he will wield high magic, which makes sense because Quaish is a purified strain of all 8 winds. So he's an excellent hybrid caster and melee combatant who 
rides into battle atop his glorious griffin, Stormwing, who has a new model with the back legs of a leopard and the regal bearing of a bald eagle. Looks quite a bit different than Deathclaw. I think CA have really outdone themselves there. His mount looks incredible. On the flip side, we've got Warlord Grom the Paunch, the fattest, the meanest, the greenest great goblin warboss to ever live, the only greenskin to ever successfully invade Ulthwan, a leader of gobos whose presence will cause the Groby to stand up straight, refrain from backtalk, and even limit their rampant nose picking, because Grom is a god, a living incarnation of everything a gobo should aspire to be. The reason he's so big boned is that he ate a portion of raw troll meat, which as we know, regenerate. And so began the battle of the belly as his body struggled to outgrow the raging flesh in his stomach and to digest it before he split straight down the middle. He became quite the big chungus, so much so in fact, that he earned the title of large and in charge of the broken axe tribe, where he quickly made a name for himself in the wolflands to the east of the badlands. But his adventures carried him all the way to the empire long before the reign of Karl Franz, when they had a complete wuss on the throne, the IV, and after rampaging through Midland, he sailed for Ulthuan at the head of a terrifying host. Now, Grom's Wa is actually a really big deal in Warhammer lore, because Tor Ivres, near the eastern coast of Ulthuan, is a focal point for the Waystones to support the Great Vortex, and due to the destructive nature of the Greenskins, their conquest of Altharion's home turf, would have seen the misalignment or utter ruination of one of the core pillars of the Vortex itself. And we know very well what happens when people screw with the Vortex. Demonic invasions and Armageddon are sure to follow. So, in the lore, Altharion made it home from Nagarond just in time to crush this Wa and defend his people, which is why he was given leadership of Tori Vress in the first place. He saved all of its citizens from a rather ignoble end. It would have been a bad death for them. And according to Josh Reynolds, one of the most prolific Black Library authors, Eltharion chopped Grom into little itty bitty pieces and fed him into a magical furnace off screen so he couldn't regenerate at the conclusion of the battle for Tor Ivress. But that was never actually penned to paper in any official novel, so surely that's just some knifier propaganda. His corpulent magnificence is clearly very much alive and he's ready for round two. The Axe of Grom is known as Elfbiter, also resolved at plus two strength, grants killing blow and is better at killing elves than other weapons for the Greenskins. His Lucky Banner grants a five up ward save. He has Regeneration, which is a really big deal for the Greenskins, because their lords are inherently squishy with no way to heal. He allows all Gobble units to ignore the fear rule they typically have against elves, and Niblet, his standard bearer, is a Lucky Night Goblin blessed by Mork, who survived being sat upon by his corpulent magnificence, and is now the mascot of Grom's Wa. This is a regenerating chariot-driving maniac, which is exactly the type of Lord the Greenskins need, given their propensity to being sniped. I fully expect him to make a, shall we say, large impact for the boys when his blubber hits the battlefield in two weeks. So, the Warden and the Paunch is on its way, dropping on our doorsteps in not a very long amount of time at all, and High Elves vs. Greenskins are next on the agenda, which means new sub-factions, new campaign mechanics, new generic lords, new regiments of renown, new free LC, and new units on both sides of the conflict. And it's all going to revolve around the dungeon of Athel Tamarha, Altharion's ruined home base, and the second coming of Wa Grom. An invasion of Ult One is on the horizon, and finally, we have something that might put some pressure on the Knife Ears, and their confederation of not Atlantis. Ulthuan has been way too safe for way too long. It's time they have a legitimate rivalry here. I mean, these two characters truly hate each other. Their beef goes back centuries, and it's all coming to a head now. Like Biggie vs. Tupac, East meets West, Old World vs. New. Let's get it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I personally like the Lord Packs that have that built-in lore rivalry. They've just got more to work with. It adds more to the dynamics and the stakes of the campaign when each side has a real vested interest in murdering the other side. No one cares about Helmand freaking Gorse, dude. Like, there's no built-in hatred between Malice and Snickich. But there is a storied history behind the Grimm and the Grom. So let's talk campaign mechanics and how that hatred will manifest itself in Total War Warhammer 2. So for Eltharion, the dungeons of Athel Tamarha are a stark reminder of all he lost when Grom first made landfall. And they are now the prison in which his enemies will find themselves should they be struck down in battle. 
This is his home base, his bat cave, the place he returns to when he wants to rebuild and make his homeland strong again. Has a very unique ability called the Warden's Cage, a bound net of Amantok essentially, and if an enemy lord or hero is killed while it's active on them, they'll be dragged to the dungeons and await interrogation or execution, which provides a bunch of benefits for your faction depending on what you want to do with them. And it sounds like you can kind of play Pokemon with enemy legendary lords. Gotta catch them all! This might be one of, if not the only ways, to permanently eliminate legendary characters from the campaign without utterly destroying their faction. Which is dope. Just let them rot in prison if you want to while you cackle gleefully and extort them for some cash monies. I'm a little worried about the mechanic overall because it might force players to fight really lopsided crappy battles that should just be getting auto-resolved. So I'm hoping you don't just lose out on the opportunity to capture lords and put them in the dungeon just because you didn't feel like crushing a 5 unit stack in person or something. If there's a mechanic that allows you to do it from the campaign map side, that would probably be beneficial. But yeah, the idea itself is really cool. I just don't want to be forced into fighting minor stack battles where I could easily crush them, but just by hitting auto resolve, but I miss out on all the benefits. Basically, everything is going to be building towards the finale of Wagram 2.0. So as you level up Athel Tamara, Tori Vress will become more and more powerful, get better walls, better fortifications, and you'll get unique units that only Altharion can recruit as well. Including this mist ability that has made Ivress famous, that shrouds Ulthuan from danger and makes your troops stronger. Stuff like slowing the movement of enemy armies, causing attrition as they march, making it more difficult to reach their objective, and giving your armies more bonuses to get their melee and range prowess up into the stratosphere, building to the point that will it eventually just cover all of Ulthuan. This mist will spread out and eventually cover the entire continent. So all this revolves around the dungeons of Athel Tamara, and there are a bunch of different building trees that allow you to cover all that stuff. Tied into the mechanic and Altharion's campaign are the Mist Walkers, campaign exclusive units unique to the Warden himself. And these are essentially regiments of renown from the lore, like the Athel Tamara Faith Bearers, hybrid troops with unique battlefield applications and abilities. And my personal favorite, the Knights of Torgaval, are a unit of elite griffin riders who should serve as an incredible bodyguard for Stormwing up in the skies. I'm not gonna lie though, I am a little butthurt they weren't included as a legitimate regiment of renown. I love those Orowars that flout convention and give us a truly unique unit to play with. It isn't a reskin or a reworking of an already existing one, but yeah, they're gonna be a blast, they're gonna be available in campaign, and speaking of units, what would a Lord Pack be without some new ones to play with? Huge news here! Archmages are on the way for the High Elves, and they're gaining access to all eight winds of magic, and high magic as well. Finally, gaining their long-deserved mastery of Hogwarts. Better late than never, I say. And we can only hope the other magically attuned races, with a stunning lack of magical diversity, like the Wood Elves, will soon follow suit. Bunch of new units here as well. Rangers, Silver and Guard Heavy Spears, War Lions, and White Lion Chariots of Kreis. We've been one of those for a very long time. They're going to be super cool and have a unique battlefield role. Running over infantry with a bunch of AP should be awesome. Give the High Elves a legitimate melee chariot unit for tearing through all of that infantry stuff. And the creme de la creme, the Arcane Phoenix. Another holdover from the Monstrous Arcanum. Joining Skinwolves, Fimir, and the Necrofex Colossus in that illustrious group. This will now be the highest tier Phoenix in the game. Rainbow colored and shining bright, unleashing what looks like a bound spell vortex of Akshi in the screenshot here. So expect some impressive magical DPS coming out of Moltres in the skies for this DLC. Includes three new ROR's, the Talons of Torquilada, which are actually already in SFO, Rahagra's Pride War Lions, and the Omen of Azurian Arcane Phoenix. And there is a lot of new content on offer here. We haven't even got to the green skins yet. Now, speaking of greenskins, I'm going to tackle their unit additions first before we talk about Grom's campaign. Because Dwayne Johnson is joining the Monstrous Arcanum fraternity, and my lord, he's about to drop the people's elbow. The Rock, the rogue idol of Gork and possibly Mork, is stomping its way into Warhammer 2. And if this baby ain't a DLC seller, I don't know what is. A living effigy of rock and stone, the spirit and embodiment of the Wa given armor crushing form. These babies are avatars of the Greenskin God of War, and are going to replace Giants as that Tier 5 melee mashing monster, which will hopefully mean Giants become a Tier 4 unit like we've been requesting for so long, 
and maybe get a little bit of missile resist to boot. I've been a little hesitant about them in the past and reserve the right to change my mind once I've seen their implementation, but I'm really excited to see rogue idols in action now. They look baller. Hella cool. Now on top of that, we're getting giant river troll hags, hero deathcasters with a glorious and exceptionally saggy model, river trolls, which smell absolutely horrible and are followed around by this miasma that permeates everything, will likely affect enemies with that, stone trolls, which will serve as the new top tier troll for the greenskins with a hefty dose of magic resist and probably quite a bit of armor as well, and the war boys of Mad Max. The Cult of V8, the Snotling Pump Wagons coming in three variants, a traditional chariot, the Flappas variant, and the spiky rollers. Ride shiny and green, my little minions. Red goes faster. These are crude chariots and wagons of war meant to break through dense formations of enemies with sheer momentum and can-do attitude. The Flappas will likely be faster and have a unique effect as they bounce up and down, and the spiky rollers sound like they'll be kind of more focused on the heavier AP side of things, or have armor sundering meant for chunking through armored enemies. And these are a pretty big deal for the Greenskins. Their chariot play up to this point has been exceptionally weak, actually. In fact, I'd go so far as to say the Orc Boar Chariot might be the worst melee chariot in the entire game. So having armor sundering chariots, if that's how they end up working out, should help them out quite a bit. Although to be fair, the melee grind isn't really where the Greenskins struggle. The infantry fight isn't really where they have a lot of problems, it's more with their lords getting sniped and getting terror routed after that, so maybe some changes to the battlefield implementation of WA can help them a bit on that front, grant maybe map-wide immune to psych for some of them or something like that. Now, there are three new ROWs, Logi Bogey Spore Explodus, it's a snotling pump wagon with C4 mushroom explosives strapped to the front, channeling their inner battlefield force strats with that one I guess. And these are designed to detonate any time the chariot makes contact with an enemy. Sounds super cool. The Swamp Things are a horrifying band of river trolls with terror and poison attacks. And the Big Un is the biggest, baddest, meanest, and greenest, possibly the most cunning as well, rogue idol ever given form by the greenskin shamans. So, on to a Morton Grom. And I must say, I do love how they've been incorporating pop culture references into pretty much all their trailers over the last year and a half, two years. From the Predator scene and Prophet and the Warlock, spraying the jungle with rattling gunfire, Brad Pitt at the gates of Troy, and now we got Mad Max and Amorton Grom, the self-styled king of the goblins, who must always be mounted upon his wolf chariot. He's a thick boy, all right? Doesn't feel like walking. Don't judge him, he's fluffy. Big boned. Now his campaign features revolve around his cauldron, as he Gordon Ramsay's a bunch of dishes with unique effects, using ingredients found throughout the Warhammer world. And these are gonna be nasty. If you cook up the right stuff and feast on that right collection of dishes, you'll get permanent enhancements for Grom, unique units for his armies, massive campaign-wide buffs, and form a special bond with a troll hag food merchant. Rachel Ray, eat your heart out. This hot mama knows how to cook the things. The other important aspect of his campaign mechanics comes straight from the lore. The two legendary gabos from his siege in Defenders of Ulth 1. You got Niblet, his chief advisor, the guy he sat on and didn't squish, and Blacktooth the Shaman, who was decapitated by Altharia on the Grim in an aerial duel over Tori Vress, but still serves his master with the powerful energies of Gork and Mork that are keeping him in a somewhat zombified state. And if you equip him to another character, because he's an item, this head is kind of a shamanistic ritual thing you can put on a character themselves, they can then summon a rogue idol into battle, which is pretty dope. This, of course, all comes with the promised campaign overhaul for the Greenskins, which has completely changed how WA functions both in battle and on the campaign map. A new start position for Azhag, new character skills, stat balancing for their legendary lords to hopefully make them more viable, and unit improvements that we'll be talking about in depth tomorrow. Greenskin overhaul video tomorrow, Tons of stuff to cover on that front. Going to be a very exciting few weeks. So, my overall impressions here. This DLC has a more exciting lineup for me and more impressive content overall on display than the Shadow and the Blade. I think Shadow and the Blade, the lords themselves were very cool. I think Miles could have used maybe a little bit more work, but overall I felt like their roster, especially on the Skaven side, was maybe a little bit lackluster. This one doesn't feel lackluster 
in the slightest. The unit rosters here, I mean, they're two big monsters from the Monsters Arcanum that are headline DLC sellers. You combine that with the Greenskins rework, it's going to make huge waves for Warhammer 2. There's no other way to put it. We did not get a Lothurn Skycutter, which frankly doesn't upset me too much, even though they would have had a kind of unique role on the battlefield as a flying chariot with a bolt thrower on the back. We didn't get a Dragon Mage, but there is a very good reason for that, which we'll see soon enough. And frankly, a Lore of Fire Archmage has that niche pretty well covered anyway. We didn't get Mangler Squigs or Colossal Squigs, but we got a lot of stuff I was not expecting, like that Rogue Idol, which as I said, is a DLC seller through and through and some new unit archetypes that should really prove very useful for both the high elves and the greenskins now greenskins are one of my least favorite races in warhammer i think they're relatively fun to play on the battlefield but their aesthetic doesn't really appeal that much to me but this update whether you buy the dlc or not will undoubtedly make them a lot more fun to play especially when it comes to the campaign which is a really big deal because they've needed an overhaul to this for a very long time and it has finally come and you are going to be seeing a ton of gameplay from me very very soon from multiplayer to campaign and overview stuff in terms of the overhauls and the campaign mechanics so let me know what you all think of the warden and the punch what you like what you don't like which elements are the most exciting and what kind of gets you down about everything we've seen in terms of this trailer how hype are you how not hype are you let me know and i will see you all tomorrow morning as we cover the green skin overhaul lot to cover on that front. Be there. Lots of cool stuff to show.